Hi, my name's Paul Grogan, and welcome to the third in a series of videos where I'm going to teach you how to play Aeon Trespass Odyssey. In this video, I'll be going over more details about the battle phase in which your Titans fight against the fierce Primordials. I'll be focusing more on the Primordials in this video, and in the next part, I'll cover the Titans themselves. Although I'll be making every effort to ensure that these videos are correct at the time of recording, publishers sometimes issue errata or clarifications to the rules of their games, so I'd strongly recommend checking the description of this video for any changes to the rules which may have been made after this video has been released. Also, be sure to check out the official list of errata and clarifications which can be found on the game's website. A big thank you to Into the Unknown for commissioning me to create these videos, but I also rely on the support of my Patreon campaign to keep the channel going. So if you're interested in supporting me directly, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. Whenever the game instructs you to resolve a battle, the battle phase begins. Timeline battles are resolved in the encounter step. Other battles can take place during the story step, but they can happen at other times too. At the start of a battle, the Argonauts enter the Balaneon, a giant round room on the Argo containing a pool of green liquid. Entering the pool allows each Argonaut to junction with a powerful Titan, and it's those Titans who do battle with one of the Primordials. For a timeline battle, you may always choose which of the two regular Primordials for your current cycle to fight. For cycle 1, this is Hecaton or Labyrinthorus. The evolution track shows the number of times that you have fought each Primordial so far. Since you fought Hecaton during the tutorial, one of the boxes will already be marked. And you can choose either of them to fight as long as there is at least one empty box. You then mark the leftmost empty box of that track, and that is the level of the Primordial that you now fight. For example, in this situation you have fought Hecaton three times, but never the Labyrinth Horus. You could choose to fight Hecaton again, marking this box and having a level 2 fight. Or you could choose to mark this box and fight the Labyrinth Horus at level 1. The boss and the adversary are handled differently. They are always level 1, but each time you fight them you mark the next box on the corresponding track, which changes the way that each battle is handled. The details for the different battles can be found in the back of the storybook for your current cycle. To set up a battle, first place the battle board in the middle of the play area. There are various slots around the edge of the board which is a suggested place for certain components. You don't need to follow this exactly as long as everything is nearby. Take the trauma cards and ensure that you have the correct ones. At the start of cycle 1 you should have all of the cards without a cycle number on them and all of the cards that say cycle 1 only. The Obol deck is special. At the start of the campaign this should only consist of two cards, you live and you died. The other Obol cards however should be placed nearby as they may be added to the deck during a battle. During the campaign you will be instructed to add or remove cards from these trauma decks. For example, at the end of cycle 1 you should remove the cycle 1 only cards and add in the cycle 2 only cards, and so on. Once you have the right cards, shuffle each pile separately and place them face down. Take the Moiros cards, shuffle them and place them face down as the Moiros deck. Do the same with the Kratos cards, forming the Kratos deck. Place the Kratos tokens nearby in a supply. At the start of cycle 1 you only need the opening and break tokens, but as the campaign progresses you will need to add new ones. Place the attack dice and the power dice nearby. Place the condition cards in a pile, there is no need to shuffle these. Each player places their Argonaut card and any Nemos cards in front of them, including any fated Nemos cards. If playing with fewer than 4 players, some players will control more than one Argonaut. Make sure you keep everything separate between them. Each Argonaut also needs a Triskelion. Remember that these dials do not reset at the start of a battle, so if you gained any rage, fate or danger since the last battle, ensure the dials are set correctly. Give the priority target token to the Argonaut with the highest rage. If two or more Argonauts have the equal highest or nobody has any rage, then choose one of them to gain the token. Each Argonaut then chooses an available Titan for them to control. At the start of the campaign, you only have the basic Titan available to you, the Dreamwalker. So each Argonaut takes any of the Dreamwalker Titan sheets and places it in front of them along with the corresponding miniature. Each of the Dreamwalker Titan sheets has a unique name and image, but that is only to help you identify which miniature is which. They are all just the same type of Titan. Later in the campaign, when you gain access to other types of Titan, you can take those with you as well, but no more than one of each type as there is only one sheet for each. And remember, although the Argonaut and Titan are connected during a battle, that doesn't mean that you have to control the same Titan each battle. Each Argonaut is free to choose any of the available Titans. 
If you have fewer than four Titans on the Argo at the start of a battle, things are going to be difficult. Each Argonaut not assigned to a Titan will not participate in the battle. And if you are ever about to do battle and have no Titans on board the Argo, you lose the campaign immediately. Once you have your Titans, go through all of the gear cards from the Argo Armory and assign them to the Titans. Most Titans have one armor slot, two support slots, and slots for weapons. Some special Titans unlocked during the campaign may be different. The top left icon on each gear card tells you what type it is. Armor cards have this icon, and support cards have this icon. Weapons depict a number of hands. Usually a Titan has two hands, so you could equip a two-handed weapon or two one-handed weapons. Note that shields take up hand slots and technically count as weapons. If you don't have enough gear to fill all of the hand slots of the Titans, equip a Fists card, which can actually be used as a one-handed or two-handed weapon. Even if you don't equip the Fists cards, keep them nearby as you might need them during a battle. All of these weapons, armor, shields and fists will be explained later. There are also attachment cards which will unlock as the campaign progresses. These are represented by this icon. Some attachments, like this one, attach to another gear card. Others attach to your Titan itself, and a Titan can have up to three attachments. Each Titan cannot have more than one copy of each attachment card. Argo abilities represent various ways in which the crew of the Argo can assist your Titans in battle. Your current Propylon technology card dictates your Argo ability limit, which is simply the number of corresponding technology cards that you can use during a battle. Take that many Argo ability cards from your technology deck and place them this side up. Place the indicated number of charges on each card. I'll explain later how these cards are used. Place the primordial sheet for the one you are about to fight this side up. Find its routine card and signature card and place them to the left and right like this. Make sure to use this side of the routine card and not the side with the Nistis routine on. Take all of the AI cards for the Primordial and divide them into 1, 2 and 3, based on the Roman numeral on the back. Do the same with the BP cards, and then shuffle each deck separately. Place the decks with the number 1 in the corresponding spaces. Place the other decks aside for now. These are the Escalation decks and will be used later in the battle. Place Terrain Tiles on the board as indicated in the setup diagram in the storybook. This is the setup for Hecaton level 1 to 3. If you are about to have a timeline battle and there is a terrain noted on the timeline, place that as indicated. If the notes say out of three, it must be placed entirely in the spaces within three of the edge of the board. If the notes say inner three, then it must be placed entirely in the spaces that are not within three of the edge of the board. The tile cannot be placed on a space reserved for either a Titan or a Primordial, as shown in the setup diagram, or overlapping any of the other terrain tiles. For each type of terrain, place the corresponding terrain card next to the board to help remind you of the effects of each of these tiles. Place the Titans in their starting positions. Who goes where is up to you. Then, place the Primordial on the board in its starting position. To determine its initial facing, look at the top card of the Minor Trauma deck, and note the icon in the bottom left. If it shows an arrow, turn the Primordial to face that direction. If it's a circular arrow, you can choose the direction it faces and then place the card on the bottom of the deck. Note that some scenarios use different facing and placement rules for the Primordial, which override the rules that I've just explained. Each Primordial has its own specific rules, and those rules change depending on the level of the Primordial. I'll cover those in more detail in my videos for the specific cycles of the game, but I will, however, give you a quick guided tour of the Primordial sheet. This is the one for Hecaton, the first Primordial that you fight during the tutorial. This image shows the facing of the Hecaton and indicates which two spaces count as rear spaces. There are no specific rules for rear spaces, but certain things might happen over the course of a battle which refer to these spaces. And this number here shows the unavoidable knockback value, which will be referred to at various times during the battle. On the right hand side you can see the different attributes and traits for the different levels. The main attributes are to hit, which indicates how hard it is to hit the primordial with a weapon, Speed, which is how far the Primordial can travel in a single move. And Wounds, which is the number of wounds required to kill it, and usually the victory condition for the battle. If there are any icons below the attributes, make sure to take those into account. Level 0 Hecaton, for example, has a minus 1 to its AT value, making it easier to wound. Each Primordial has one or more traits, special rules that apply to them. Be sure to apply all relevant traits. Level 0 Hecaton has the Friendly Warning trait, 
and level one Hecaton says plus all previous, so it also has the friendly warning trait. However, at level two, Hecaton gains the clever boy and a fist for a fist trait, but loses friendly warning. Some primordials also have additional setup rules. For example, Labyrinth Aurus requires you to put the Labyrinth marker here. If there are any start of battle effects that need to be resolved by either the Titans or the Primordial, do them now. Battles are resolved in a series of alternating Primordial and Titan rounds. Unless otherwise stated, the Primordial acts first, revealing one of its AI cards and following the instructions on it, usually causing it to move on the board and attack one or more of the Titans. Then it's the Titans round, during which each Titan takes a turn in an order of your choice. The battle ends in one of three ways. The Argonauts win as soon as the Primordial suffers a number of wounds equal to its wound value. Or the battle ends in defeat if all the Titans are killed. Most battles also give you the opportunity to retreat. This still counts as a defeat, but at least you will save some of your Titans. And as usual, anything printed in the battle setup can override these rules. There is also a rare effect known as Wise Providence. If you have this, you gain the initiative for the next battle. In other words, the Titans get the first round instead of the Primordial. Normally, Wise Providence affects the next timeline battle only, but sometimes it can affect a specific upcoming battle instead. The Primordial round is divided into four steps. First, if there are any effects that trigger at the start of the round, resolve them now. Then, in step two, you reveal and resolve an AI card. Resolving the AI card is the main part of the Primordial round, so I'll come back to that later on. Step three is resolving any other actions which may trigger after the main AI card. And finally, at the end of the round, resolve any effects which are specifically resolved at that time. If there is more than one, you choose the order. Before going any deeper into the details of battle, there are a few important rules that I wanted to talk about first. The battle board is divided into a 14 by 20 grid of spaces. A space is occupied if there is a miniature on the space or if there is a terrain tile with the obstacle keyword on it, otherwise it's classed as empty. For example, the space with this column is occupied, but these spaces with the ambrosia pool are not, because the pools are not obstacles. Spaces on the battle board are only ever counted orthogonally, up, down, left or right. This applies for movement, attacks and when you count the distance between two things. Here for example, this titan is at a distance of 5 from the primordial. Adjacency is also only ever counted orthogonally. The Primordial is adjacent to this Titan, but not adjacent to this one. For a Titan to attack the Primordial, it must have a clear line of sight. To check that you have line of sight, draw an imaginary line from any corner of your space to any corner of any space occupied by your target. If that line isn't blocked, then you have line of sight. If the line goes into or out of a terrain tile with the obscuring trait, such as this city, line of sight is not blocked. But if the line passes completely through obscuring terrain, then line of sight is blocked. If the line passes along the edge of obscuring terrain, then line of sight is blocked. But if it only cuts the corner, that is okay. Unless the line cuts the corner of two features that connect diagonally, in which case line of sight is blocked. Line of sight can also not go through red lines found on some terrain tiles. Miniatures, no matter how big they are, do not block line of sight. I mentioned that Titans must have line of sight to the Primordial to attack it, but the reverse isn't always true. Primordials sometimes need line of sight, but not always. I'll talk about that later. The priority target starts with the Argonaut with the highest rage. Whenever a Titan increases its rage for any reason, if it now has a higher rage than any other Titan, it becomes the new priority target and takes the token. This token acts like a tiebreaker for the purposes of targeting. If there's ever a choice of viable targets for the Primordial and one of those targets has the priority target token, then that Titan becomes the target. Other effects in the game can cause an Argonaut to keep the token even if another character gets more rage. Resolving an AI card is a five step process. I'll explain them briefly first and then go into more detail. You first reveal the top AI card from the deck. Then you determine the target of the attack. Next, you resolve any movement of the Primordial, followed by the Primordial's attack. And finally, resolve any after attack effects if there are any. Let's now go over those steps in more detail. Step one is to reveal the next AI card from the deck. The Roman numeral on the back of the card indicates its level, which is how dangerous the card is. 
Step two is to determine the target of the attack by following the different targeting options listed on the card. Read each instruction from top to bottom until you can find one that you can resolve, and then stop there. The cold open card, for example, first wants to target the closest Titan in front in range. If it cannot find a Titan in front in range, it moves to the next line, which is the closest Titan in sight. All of the targeting instructions are explained in the rulebook, but there are a few common ones that I will explain here. Each primordial has a facing on the board. Any space on the board literally in front of the miniature itself, no matter how much to the side, is in front. The closest Titan is the one that is the shortest distance away from the primordial. Here, for example, Solon is the closest Titan, at a distance of three, but he isn't in front. So the closest one in front is Philoctera, at a distance of five. If the targeting instructions also include the word in range, then the primordial must be able to reach the target by moving up to its speed value, which for the level one Hecaton is six. And again, movement is only ever in the cardinal directions, never diagonally. So in our example, Philoctera would be the target of the attack. She is the closest Titan, which is also in front, and the Hecaton can get adjacent to her by moving up to its speed value. But what if there were no Titans in front in range? Here, Philoctera is in front, but she is not in range. In other words, if the Hecaton would move six spaces, it would not end up adjacent. In this case, you go to the next targeting instruction, which is closest Titan in sight, which uses the line of sight rules that I mentioned earlier. In this case, Solon is the closest Titan in sight. And note that this targeting line doesn't include the word in range, so even if the closest Titan in sight is out of range, it still becomes the target. And I said earlier that the primordial doesn't always need line of sight to resolve its attack, and this is true. It only needs line of sight if the targeting instructions use the word in front or in sight. For example, on the Smash AI card, the first targeting line is priority target in range. Because that doesn't use the words in front or in sight, that means that a line of sight is not needed. So here, Philoctera, who has the priority target token, is behind obscuring terrain, which blocks line of sight. Even though the primordial does not have line of sight to her, that is not a requirement of this particular targeting instruction, so she is still the target. If you go through all of the targeting instructions and there is no valid target for any of them, which is quite rare, then you discard the AI card to the discard pile. And instead, the primordial resolves its routine card, which for the Hecaton means that the Argo loses one hull. After determining its target, the primordial usually moves as shown on the AI card. Generally speaking, the primordial will move along the shortest path, trying to get within range of its target. Unless stated otherwise, primordial attacks require adjacency, and it will stop moving as soon as it reaches a space that it can attack from. At the start of movement, the primordial first turns to face its target. If it could then move in a straight line to get adjacent to its target, then that is what it does. If the primordial is not already in a straight line, then the players choose the first direction of movement as long as it moves closer to its target. In this case, it could be either to the right or down. Let's say it moves right. It then moves one space at a time in a zigzag fashion until it reaches a position where it can then move in a straight line towards its target. If, however, it moved down first, then after its first movement, it is now in a straight line, so it continues straight to its target. And in this particular example, it didn't matter which movement came first. The end result is the same. But let's say the situation was similar, but now Solon is here. As usual, the primordial will either move right one, then down, and then to the right, or it will move down one, and then to the right. If you choose the second of these options, the primordial moves through the space containing Solon. This is bad news for him, who suffers an effect known as Crash. I'll explain Crash in a bit more detail in a minute, but it's not good, so you probably want to choose the first option. At the end of the primordial's movement, it turns to face its target, if not already facing it. Primordials ignore all terrain tiles on the board, treating them as if they are not there. The only exception to this is terrain with the keyword destructible, such as this column. These are destroyed and removed from the board if the primordial moves onto or through one of them. This rule may be different when the primordial is moved involuntarily. For example, if a titan pushes a primordial into a column, you roll the dice and apply the effect listed. Titans do not get in the way of primordial movement at all, and after the primordial has finished moving, any titan on a space that was moved through suffers crash. Their danger increases by one and they suffer knockdown, 
which is represented by laying their mini on each side and then taking a knocked down condition card with the falling side showing. If the primordial ends its movement on a space occupied by a titan, then that titan also suffers crash, but in addition to that, they suffer unavoidable knockback based on the primordial's unavoidable knockback value, shown on its primordial sheet. The knockback must be in a direction away from the primordial, and if there is more than one possible direction, the player controlling the titan chooses. For example, four titans are fighting Temenos, a boss primordial that takes up nine spaces. The target is the furthest titan in front in range, and the AI card says to move and attack. The primordial moves four spaces to the right. Solon was only moved through, so he suffers crash, increasing his danger by one and suffering knockdown. The primordial ended its movement on top of both of these titans. They also suffer crash, and in addition to that, unavoidable knockback. This titan is knocked back either to the left or down, as both of these move it away from the primordial. The players choose. This titan, however, is in the middle space. It can be knocked back in any of the four cardinal directions. I'll explain knockback in more detail later in this video, but one thing to note is that unavoidable knockback cannot be reduced in any way. So even though a hecaton of level 0 and 1 has the friendly warning trait, reducing all knockbacks by 2, unavoidable knockback is not affected. After any movement is completed, the primordial attacks, if within range of the target. Any attack that doesn't specify a type is a melee attack, and requires the target to be adjacent to the primordial. Remember, adjacency, like everything else, is only counted orthogonally. So this titan is adjacent, whereas this one is not. I'm going to cover the rules for melee attacks first. I'll talk about the other types of attack in a later video. To resolve an attack, the target must roll a number of evasion dice as shown on the AI card. In this case, four. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why are we rolling evasion dice already? Surely you need to determine if the primordial has hit us. Well, in Aeon Trespass Odyssey, the primordials will always hit you unless you manage to evade them. To perform an evasion roll, take the number of 10-sided dice as indicated on the card. One die must be white and the rest must be black. The white die is known as the crit die. You then roll the dice. You are trying to roll equal to or higher than the difficulty, which in this case is six or more. Any roll of the special symbol counts as a 10. Any gear cards that you have with an evasion bonus depicted by this icon allow you to add that bonus to each roll. And you also get one chance to re-roll your dice. If you have any gear with a number of evasion re-rolls such as this one, that allows you that many re-rolls for free. And for each other die that you want to re-roll, you must gain one fate. Work out how many dice you will re-roll and then re-roll them. You cannot re-roll the same dice more than once, and all re-rolls must be performed at the same time. For example, you roll four evasion dice and you only get one success. You're carrying a shipwrecker shield, so you get two free re-rolls. You decide to gain one fate for a third re-roll, and then you re-roll the three dice that originally failed. Each result equal to or greater than the difficulty is a successful evade, whereas each result lower than the difficulty is a fail, and the primordial hits you. No matter how many modifiers you have, each natural roll of a 1 is always a fail, and each natural roll of a 10 is always a success. And when I say a natural 1 or 10, what I mean is, is that if you have an evasion bonus of plus 1 and you roll a 9, that doesn't count as a natural 10. A natural 10 is the number showing on the die before any modifiers. Also, if you roll a natural 10 on the white die, you have done a crit evade, and you get to resolve any crit evade abilities such as this one on the shipwrecker shield. Rolling a 10 on the black dice is just a 10. If you don't have anything with a crit evade ability, then nothing special happens. If you roll a natural 1 on the white die, that is a crit evade fail, which again doesn't do anything unless you have a card in play with a crit evade fail ability. And if you think that you can simply re-roll a 1 on the white die to avoid a crit evade fail, unfortunately you can't get away that easy. You can re-roll the die, but the crit evade fail from the previous roll still takes effect. And if you re-roll and get another one, the crit evade fail happens twice. After performing the evasion roll, any re-rolls and reducing the number of hits from block abilities, if you manage to successfully reduce the number of hits to zero, this is what classes as a full evade. Two things happen when you get a full evade. First, if you have any full evade abilities, you get to resolve those now. Second, you skip the rest of the attack on the AI card, meaning that you don't take any danger or any consequences of that attack. However, you must still resolve any after-attack effect if there is one. 
I also wanted to just mention a special rule about defensive weapons. As mentioned earlier, shields are technically weapons in this game, as they take up a hand slot. If you use a defensive ability on a weapon, such as the two re-rolls from the Shipwrecker Shield, that becomes your active weapon for the current attack of the Primordial. And you can only have one active weapon at any time. What this means is that if you have another weapon equipped which also has a defensive ability, you cannot use that during this attack. For example, there is nothing stopping you from wielding a Shipwrecker Shield and a Siren Shield, as each takes up one hand slot. However, this would not really give you any benefit, as you can only use one of them against each attack. Ok, so going back to the attack, as long as the Primordial scored at least one hit on you, all of the effects of a successful attack are applied. Usually, most attacks scale depending on the number of hits received. Cold Open, for example, is simply one danger per hit, so if you were hit twice, you would increase your danger by two. This card, for example, is similar in that you gain one danger per hit, but you also suffer knockdown, as long as at least one hit was scored. Whenever you are about to be dealt danger from a Primordial attack, if you have any gear with armor dice, as shown on the right side of the card, you must roll those power dice now. Siren Panoply Armor gives you one red power die, and if you gain one fate to trigger the reinforce ability, you roll an extra red die. This is called an armor roll. Each of these small triangular symbols that you roll reduces the danger that you are dealt by one. One very important rule about power dice is that you cannot re-roll them by gaining fate. If you manage to reduce the amount of danger dealt by the attack to zero, you can breathe a sigh of relief, but if you took at least one danger, you must now make a trauma draw. In Aeon Trespass Odyssey, there are no hit points. Instead, whenever you get hit in combat, your level of danger rises, representing how close your Titan is to death. And whenever your danger increases from a primordial attack, you must make a trauma draw, which happens immediately after the danger has been dealt, before resolving any other effects of the attack. To perform a trauma draw, compare your current danger level to your trauma table on your Titan sheet. This tells you which trauma deck to draw from. For the default trauma table of a Dreamwalker Titan, if your danger is 1 to 3, you draw from the minor trauma deck, 4 to 6 from the major trauma deck, 7 to 9 from the grave trauma deck, and 10 or more from the obol deck. The icon in the bottom right of the card tells you whether the trauma card is a positive or negative one. That's right, making a trauma draw isn't always a bad thing. Although don't get too excited, there are some cards in the more dangerous decks that will outright kill you. Some trauma cards have immediate effects. Resolve them, and unless told otherwise, place the card on the bottom of the corresponding deck. Others stay with you for the battle, causing you to suffer some kind of ongoing effect. The Obol deck is a special trauma deck. At the start of the campaign it contains two cards, You Live and You Died. One special rule about the Obol deck is that whenever you resolve an Obol card, it is shuffled back into the deck instead of being placed on the bottom. Another rule that a lot of people get wrong is that you only draw a trauma card when you are dealt danger from a Primordial's attack. If another effect in the game tells you to gain danger, such as the wound response on this BP card, you simply gain the danger. You don't draw a trauma card. And that is the difference between gaining danger and being dealt danger. However, since the Triskelion dials only go to 9, if you gain danger that would take you above 9, this does trigger an Obol draw, even if it wasn't from the result of an attack. For example, Herodotus is currently on 8 danger. The Hecaton, targeting one of the other Titans, ends its movement on Herodotus' space, causing Crash and increasing his danger to 9. This does not cause a trauma draw. However, because the Primordial ended its movement on Herodotus' space, he suffers unavoidable knockback, and no matter which way he chooses, he is knocked into a column. I'll cover knockback into obstacles later in this video, but essentially, if a Titan is knocked back into a destructible obstacle, the obstacle is destroyed and the Titan suffers crash. This causes his danger to increase by 1 to what would be 10. The Triskelion dial stays at 9. However, he must resolve an Obol draw at danger level of 10. Assuming he lives, his danger is now 9. But it gets worse. If your danger would ever increase to 14 or higher, the rules for massive danger apply. Remember those other Obol cards that are not part of the Obol deck initially? Well, these cards can get added into the deck before drawing the Obol card as follows. If anyone's danger goes to 14 or higher, add in the You Died Horribly card. If anyone's danger goes to 18 or higher, add in Your Gruesome Death Becomes Legend. And if anyone's danger goes to 21 or higher, add in Your Death Transcends Reality. 
And these effects stack. So if the first time in the game the massive danger rules apply, if someone's danger goes to 18 or higher, you add in those first two cards. This effectively makes obol draws far more dangerous for everyone for the rest of the battle. The cards are only removed after the battle is over. The final step of resolving an AI card is to deal with any after attack effects printed on the card. An after attack is completely separate from the main attack, so they happen even if you fully evaded the actual attack, or if the primordial didn't perform that attack because it was out of reach. Unless stated otherwise, an after attack effect targeting a single titan affects the original target of the attack. Finally, after resolving any after attack effects, the card is placed on the discard pile. If the AI deck is now empty, shuffle the AI discard pile to form a new AI deck. There are special AI cards for simultaneous attacks, zone attacks and judgments. I'll cover these in a later video. During my explanation of the Primordial's AI cards, you will have noticed these light brown boxes next to some of the lines. These are fate effect triggers and they modify the AI card based on your current fate level. Managing your fate is an important part of the game. You can gain it to re-roll dice and for some other abilities, but fate can be a cruel mistress. Cold Open, for example, normally requires you to roll four evasion dice, but if your fate is three or higher, you roll one more. And note that the number of dice you roll is determined before you re-roll dice using your fate. And each hit from Furious Smash normally deals one danger, but if your fate is four or higher, each hit deals two danger instead. Also note that this fate effect happens after any re-rolls because of where the effect is shown on the card. Other cards might have triggers based on things other than fate, so keep an eye out for those. Although I'm going to cover the rules for battles with specific primordials in my later video, there are some effects which are common to many of them, so I'm going to explain a few of them here, specifically knockdown and knockback. Knockdown can happen as the result of an AI card, due to the primordial moving through your space, because of crash and various other effects. However it happens, you lay your mini on its side and gain the knockdown condition card on the side labelled falling. As you can see on the card, a titan with this condition cannot move, attack or perform actions. The titan effectively skips its next turn, at the end of which you flip the card over. At this point, if through a game effect you voluntarily move or perform an attack, use an action or ability, you stand up and discard the card. Otherwise, at the start of your next turn, you stand up, discard the card and then take that turn as normal. So why not just discard the card at the end of the turn that you've skipped? Well, this is because there is a rule in the game that means you cannot gain a condition if you already have one of the same name. Meaning that even if you have the card on the standing up side, you cannot be knocked down again. Otherwise, you may end up getting continually knocked down without being able to take any actions, which is no fun. I also want to just cover some of the things that you can and cannot do when knocked down, as this is a common question people have. The card says that you cannot move voluntarily, attack, use actions or abilities, but it's the use abilities part which needs further explanation. Armour rolls on gear can be and in fact must be rolled. However, the reinforce ability cannot be used as it's an ability that you must choose to activate by gaining one fate. You still get stat bonuses from your gear as they are passive ongoing effects. And you might think that the second chance ability here cannot be used. However, in the rulebook, Second Chance specifically states that it can be used even when knocked down. Evasion rerolls on defensive gear still work, and in fact, Crit Evade and Full Evade abilities work normally as they are constant abilities. You cannot choose whether they happen or not. You can still use any abilities that reduce knockbacks as they are passive ongoing effects. However, these two abilities cannot be used. And none of the abilities on Siren Survivor can be used. On the Someone Waiting card, the only reason this ability works is that it specifically says it can be used when knocked down. However, this ability cannot be used. Knockback is another common occurrence in Aeon Trespass Odyssey, as the Primordials bash the Titans around the board. To resolve a knockback effect, move the affected miniature X spaces directly away from the source in a straight line. When a Titan is knocked back, they ignore all terrain tiles moved through except for terrain tiles with the obstacle keyword. For example, Ulysses suffers knockback fall. The Ambrosia pool does not have the obstacle keyword, so she is knocked back the full four spaces and ends here. There are two types of obstacle, destructible and indestructible. If knocked back into a destructible obstacle, such as this column, the obstacle is destroyed, removed from the board, and the Titan ends up in its space, ending the knockback. 
The Titan also suffers crash, which is plus one danger and knockdown. If the Titan is knocked back into an indestructible obstacle, such as this red line on a labyrinth tile, it stops moving on the space just before the tile and suffers crash. If a Titan is knocked back into the edge of the board, continue to resolve the knockback, moving it along the edge in such a way that its initial movement is away from the source of the knockback. Sometimes knockback will indicate a direction, such as to the left or to the right. In these cases, resolve the knockback in that direction in relation to the source, instead of directly away. Titans ignore other titans when being knocked back. But if a titan ever ends up on the same space as another, the other titan is displaced and moved to an adjacent empty space of their choice. If that is somehow not possible, then the Titan who would be displaced is immediately killed. One thing I did want to briefly mention about knockback and knockdown is that they require the primordial to be within the attack range of the Titan. For this video, I've only talked about simple melee attacks, so knockback and knockdown will always happen. But in the next video, we'll see how knockback and knockdown can also appear as primordial responses, meaning that the primordial gets to do them in response to being attacked. And if a Titan attacks with a weapon at range 2 or more and triggers a knockdown or knockback response, that response fails, as the Titan is not adjacent to the Primordial. And there are also reflex moves which Titans can perform in windows of opportunity, after being attacked, but before any knockdown or knockback happens. Which again causes them to fail, as the Titan is no longer adjacent to the Primordial. But all of that will be covered in my next video, where I'll be talking about the battle phase in more detail from the Titan's point of view. I hope you found this video useful. As always, please give the video a like, leave me a comment and subscribe to the channel. And as mentioned earlier, I do rely on the financial support of my Patreon campaign to keep the channel going. So if you're in a position to be able to support me directly, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. Patreon supporters get exclusive access to the gaming rules community and some additional bonus content. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching.